It is my privilege at this time to welcome our commencement speaker for this year. George Gilder is editor-in-chief of Gilder Technology Report and chair of Gilder Publishing, LLC. He is also a senior fellow of the Discovery Institute where he is chair for the Center on Wealth, Poverty, and Morality. Gilder championed the free market as a key architect of President Ronald Reagan's supply-side economic policies of the 1980s. He received the White House Award for Entrepreneurial Excellence under President Reagan and remains Reagan's most frequently quoted living author. I think that is a designation that is very likely to stick. Over the years, Mr. Gilder has consistently demonstrated an instinct for foreseeing the impacts of new and emerging technologies, including the internet and the high-tech economy to which it has given rise. His New York Times bestseller, Wealth and Poverty, the powerful and timeless defense of capitalism for which he is best known, was recently updated and reissued. Good graduation gift idea. In his most recent book that I am currently reading, Knowledge and Power, The Information Theory of Capitalism, and how it is revolutionizing our world, Gilder synthesizes his analysis of technology and economics to build a new theory of capitalism. Gilder shows that the creative economy is not shaped by incentives, but by unpredictable surprises, information. This information shifts and expands the economy, driving growth in ways that could not possibly be foreseen. In Knowledge and Power, Gilder introduces his vision of an American economy revitalized by unobstructed entrepreneurship and the accumulation of knowledge through the power of free markets. And all God's people said, <laughs> Amen. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Mr. George Gilder. Thank you, President Thornberry and Chairman Hanley and all the faculty of King's College and thanks for this glorious sight for this event. You know, I go to a lot of events, uh, many of them uh, outdoors and, and uh, frequented by umbrellas and furtive people running toward the trees on the edge. And, and it always has occurred to me that someday there might be invented a, an enclosed sacred place <laughs> where weddings and commencements and, and sacred services could be held with a roof. And, uh, you might even call it a church. <laughs> So it's uh, thrilling to be here at this wonderful event. And I want to start by reciting some wisdom from the great business guru, Peter Drucker. And Peter Drucker said, don't solve problems. Now what could Drucker have meant? I mean, homo sapiens, we get up in the morning and we start solving problems. We look at the landscape ahead and figure out the best path for the day. And yet, when we solve problems, most of the time we just restore the status quo. Solving problems, we feed our failures, we starve our strengths, and achieve costly mediocrity. We prop up the past in the name of progress. So Drucker's first rule is don't solve problems. Pursue opportunities. Drucker's second rule is don't merely be efficient. Efficiency may solve problems. 
but efficiency is way overrated in economics. The Holocaust was efficient. An automobile headed over a cliff may be efficient. Don't be efficient. Be effective. Far more important than doing things right is finding the right things to do. When you pursue opportunities, you can change the entire context of the problem so it goes away. You transcend the problem and address it on a new plane. You look at your faith rather than at your feet. You leap before you look. You do not merely contemplate the evidence. Most of what is important in life is not evident. You cannot see new things, the surprises that uh, constitute the great blessings of your life from an old place. It's the imaginative leap that gives you the vantage to see new things, new opportunities. You understand that in a way, belief precedes knowledge. If you have no idea of uh, the world, you can't see anything valuable in it. Faith precedes facts. Now much of the world of intellectual elites remains in the grip of a philosophy that I call the flat universe theory. The flat universe theory claims that all reality, including your bodies and even your minds, is fully explicable through chemistry and physics. Another name for this theory is materialism, and these people are in the grip of the materialist superstition, the idea that our whole lives are nothing but fluctuations of material. And any non-material phenomenon is merely emergent. It's emergent from the material basis of reality. In fact, the flat universe scientists are not actually sure that your minds exist. They think consciousness is a very serious problem, but it may well be an illusion. <laughs> Now today, you enter a world afflicted with all the age-old problems. Poverty, violence, crime, hatred, war, you know it. The flat universe theorists believe that they can solve such problems on the material plane, mostly through government programs. Almost 50 years ago, I began studying the problem of poverty in America. And I planned a book to be called The Pursuit of Poverty that would explain poverty. Following the views of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was then a sociologist at Harvard, I reached the conclusion that the breakdown of the family was the source of most of the poverty and disorder in the inner city. I also discovered that the problem of poverty itself doesn't need to be explained, really. Poverty has been the affliction of most of the human race ever since the Stone Age. What needs to be explained is wealth. So I changed the name of the book to Wealth and Poverty. 
At that time, the portion of black children born out of wedlock in America was 26%. And both Moynihan and I were horrified by these numbers. More than 10% of black youths were unemployed. I wrote at the time that to solve that problem with government programs would take a social welfare state to care for the women and children and a police state to handle the boys. Today, the share of black children born out of wedlock in the United States has tripled to nearly 80%. The portion of views out of work has more than tripled to close to 30% or more. Over the subsequent 50 years, nearly 50 years, compassionate problem solvers have lashed trillions of dollars on a social welfare state aimed to solve this problem. The result has been ever more poor women and children with no father in the home. And all the sociology shows that the absence of a father in the home is the key factor in poverty. What about the boys? Where is that police state I predicted? Well, today, close to a third of all black young men between 14 and 35 are in jail, are on probation, or are on the lam from the law. We solve the problem of intractable boys with a world-leading program of incarceration, imprisoning a huge number of them. The alternative to family is prison. That is the harvest of problem-solving, compassionate problem-solving American liberalism and materialism. So having solved the problem of poverty, the Flat Universe Society is now moving on to solve the problem of bad weather. <laughs> or as they call it, climate change. Full of confidence that no new resources can be created, they believe that the Earth is running out of what they term non-renewable resources. Sometimes, somehow grow more and more every year. <laughs> they believe that people are not sufficiently efficient in using energy. So every time you go to a hotel in America, you get nagged about efficiency with your towels. <laughs> the fact is that there is no problem of climate change. And I, I say this having studied this for a decade or more, and you find that temperatures today are slightly lower than the average over the last 3,000, 5,000, or 10,000 years. And climate isn't a matter of next year. Climate is a matter of patterns over long periods of time. There's no increase in violent weather whatsoever. And temperatures are warm only by comparison to the little ice age that uh, the, we're still emerging from slowly today. Yet last month, your competition, uh, President Thornberry, Drew Faust, the MIT educated president of Harvard University, announced a plan to solve the problem of bad weather that bothers her up in Cambridge. <laughs> Spurring her on was a hundred million dollar climate change project at Yale, and there's another one at Princeton and across the land, plus beckoning billions of possible federal matching grants. Adding to the $500 billion Harvard Endowment 
she set out to raise 400 million more to dedicate Harvard and all its science faculties to the cause of combating bad weather, climate change. The hundreds and billions of dollars of programs to fight bad weather are not benign or trivial. They're corrupting science and science education all across this country from kindergartens to graduate schools and on beyond. <coughs> They're distracting and debauching venture capital in Silicon Valley, which is really an important a source of all the creativity in our economy. And increasingly, Silicon Valley is devoted to an effort to create perpetual motion machines. They're aggravating the impoverishment of much of the third world, which is being lavished with appropriate technologies that don't really work. These efforts are also stultifying the student bodies of these uh, competitive uh, universities. Harvard students, for example, voted 80% for a resolution to withdraw all Harvard's investments in carbon-based fossil fuels, same fuels that supply them with their food and fuel and warmth and allow them to live. Previously, the same Harvard classes had massively aligned themselves, 80%, with reactionary anti-Semites around the globe, demanding divestment from Israel. Now, Israel's the creative found of pioneering water and fuel uh, efficiencies, which are important for the world. But perhaps more important to these students at Harvard in their daily lives, Israeli companies are also the source of most of the information tools, many of them that shape their lives, from a Facebook post and Google searches to cross-campus wireless to Kindle streams, all these to their Kinect video games, all these technologies are heavily dependent on advances made in Israel. These student lifestyles are as dependent on Israel as they are on oil. Under the rule of this corrupt plutocracy, America's most prestigious universities are showing long, strong evidence of precipitous decline. And as, a, as an ashamed aloneness, let me tell you, don't touch that ivy. <laughs> so don't solve problems. Pursue opportunities. You students at King's College have benefited from an education hugely superior to the feckless indoctrination conducted by those uh, famous universities to the north. You are a saving remnant, truly. And now you have a huge opportunity before you, to, and that is to seize national and world leadership from the corrupt and demented elites that are currently leading our country toward a dismal future. And the most exciting opportunities in the world today come from the application of a new science. And it's called information theory. It was shaped during the last century by such men as Kurt Gödel, John von Neumann, Alan Turing, and Claude Shannon, that many people don't even know about, but these are really the titans of the 20th century. This is the science that's behind all the advances in computers, computers and communication technologies, fiber optics and the internet. It is also the science behind all the major breakthroughs in recent years in biotech and medicine. 
uh, the, epitomized by the mapping of DNA and, uh, and the human genome. Information theory is also addressing some of the key enigmas of physics that become more and more acute as time passes. It becomes clear that physics doesn't even explain physics. <laughs> and uh, here they use what is called quantum information. My daughter wrote a book about it called <coughs> Age of Entanglement. Information theory begins with a flat, with a categorical rejection of the flat universe theory. Information theory sees that human bodies are not merely meat machines, but are information systems. And they're not explained, the human mind is not explained in any way by its chemistry or its physics. Any more than knowing every atom in a computer can tell you anything about what the computer is doing. Computers need outside programmers. <coughs> Oracles is what Alan Turing called them. And uh, when Turing was asked what an oracle was, well, he couldn't tell you, tell, him, tell you right away, but the one thing he was sure of was it could not be a machine. <coughs> It's a hierarchical machine echoing the hierarchical universe. Information theorists recognize that disease is not a chemical imbalance, something wrong with your chemistry and physics, but a conflict between two programmed and programmable uh, bioorganisms us and the microorganisms that may be uh, infesting us. The, the way to solve the problem is not to inject new chemicals, random chemicals, and see which ones stick under the flat universe program that really still dominates much of pharmacology. It is to reprogram the information in our bodies to respond to the infective assault. The young man in his 20s, Matt Schultz, who for 12 years served as the computer technician at the Discovery Institute, he was, uh, never went to college, has started a new drug company called Immusoft, which is backed by such eminent venture capitalists as Peter Thiel. Based on information theory, it treats the human body as a programmable platform that contains trillions of what are called ribosomes in each cell that can fabricate any protein, any molecule needed to respond to disease. Immusoft moves drug manufacture from giant factories around the world into our own bodies using programmable viruses and synthetic vectors or carriers immusoft reprograms human immune cells top down <coughs> to produce the precise molecules needed to fight disease refuting the flat universe theory the findings of 21st century science show that the universe is hierarchical top down. It is impossible to solve problems bottom up on the basis of looking before you leap at the chemistry and physics alone. This reality expresses a key insight of Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA. He called it the central dogma of molecular biology. And the central dogma shows that influence can flow from the DNA information to the proteins, but not the other way around. The proteins can't affect the information program 
inscribed in the DNA. And the DNA is a neutral carrier of information, like a sheet of paper or a computer memory, independent of its physical uh, basis. You can put the DNA program in a silicon chip if you wanted. So the central dogma asserts that the DNA message comes first. Biological dogma thus recapitulates St. John's assertion of the primacy of the word over the flesh. The word comes first is the fundamental wisdom of biology and of the Bible. In the beginning was the word is the wisdom behind all the greatest achievements of 21st century, from computers to new medicines. And it's a huge opportunity. Like all of us, the intellectual leaders of this century will have to come to terms with a hierarchical universe. That comes kind of natural to you folks at King's College, right? The flat universe people may be doubtful of what consciousness is, but we know that it's where we live and how we know. It's the essence of our lives, and if the science of the brain can't explain consciousness, it really can't explain anything. It's really empty. The, I mean, there are two ways to see consciousness, either as a problematical uh, emergent glimmer that somehow arises from the fluctuations of our chemistry and physics, or we can see our consciousness as the most important thing in our lives, it is our lives, as an echo of a larger consciousness that not only fills this exquisite arena today, this church, but also fills the entire universe with its power. And that is the real message, and it outlines the tremendous opportunity of all of you to be creative in your lives in the image of your creator. Thank you.